Thank you. Thank you for having me here at the uh, Chicago Humanities Festival and for uh, turning up on a Saturday midday. Um, so what is design? I'm being asked that all the time. So don't include that in your Twitter questions. <laughs> um, is design the um, addition of things, the addition of decorative elements, a luxury, a way to make things fancier, to make things around us simply more attractive? I'm not sure. It does that for sure. Design, design in part does that. It certainly isn't a luxury. For me, design is about intent. One of my heroes, um, the architect Bill McDonough said, um, I'm going to read one of his quotes, design is the first signal of human intention. We can ask our, ourselves at this moment as a species, what is our intention for the planet? We are the dominant species, so it is appropriate for us to ask ourselves this question. If our intention is to contaminate the air with carbon, to pollute our rivers, to, and to poison the oceans, then we're doing great. If that's our vision, and that's our plan. But if that's not our plan, then what is the plan? End of quote. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, yes, I agree. Design is our first indication of intent. And then, what is our intent for the world, and how can design contribute to that intent? For me, design needs to accomplish two things. And they seemingly could be seen as opposites. For one, it needs to build efficient and successful businesses. And two, it needs to change the world by creating sustainability and social solutions. For example, this is a project that I've, that I've been associated with, that I've been um, a part of. It's been an honor for the last seven years. Um, and it's been a really big disruption. It's called the One Laptop Per Child. When, when we looked at seven years ago with Nicholas Nicoponte, the founder of the MIT Media Lab and the founder of One Laptop Per Child, when we looked at the fact that the poorest 20% of teenagers in Zambia or Tanzania or Nigeria have less than four years of school, when we looked at the fact that in the Philippines and Peru, the number of years in school is estimated as just more than six, we felt that this was unacceptable. So Nicolas Negroponte started this initiative to create the $100 laptop. Um, and he came to me to help, him, to help provide um, him and the children in the poorest nations with a free, a rugged, a low cost, a low power, and a connected laptop for young people in hard to reach and challenged places. Nicholas felt strongly that the one laptop per child had to look and feel and function in ways that was gonna set it apart, set it apart from business solutions, set it apart from commercial solutions set it apart from you know, the commercial imperatives um, that are driving today uh, the makers of electronic products. So every decision that we made about the one laptop per child was about whether the kids were going to love it, whether they were going to love every, every part of it. So this is not a hand-me-down, low-tech type of effort. It has many very specifically designed features and specifically designed technologies, whether it's how we address power, how we address um, uh, charging in classrooms, how we create uh, sol solar Wi-Fi repeaters for the schools. Um, it really needs to address specific needs and, and, um, that the environment uh, requires. And there are now three million of these laptops in the world. Very few of them in the United States. <clears throat> but 
Um, many of them, for example, um, I, I'll, I'll show you a few examples of different programs around the world, but many of them in Uruguay. In Uruguay, 100% of the kids between the age of 6 and 18 years old have one, have one of these laptops. Um, this is also the first OLPC deployment where internet connectivity is not just provided at the schools, but also in the community. These laptops are taken home. Um, kids, as you know, are very, very good teachers to others. And um, they teach their parents, they teach their siblings. 99% of the students in Uruguay have access to, um, to the internet. They even made a stamp to commemorate the, um, um, the, the day against child labor. Um, this is one of the official stamps uh, in Uruguay. In uh, Rwanda, uh, the program was started when um, we launched the One Laptop Per Child in 2008 and created a program called Give One, Get One. Um, so people essentially would get one of these and we would put the rest, the second one they, they had purchased, in a bank. 10,000 of them were delivered in Rwanda and today they have 210,000 of them. In Afghanistan, there's only 5,000 laptops, but they're making a big difference, and this program is trying to expand. The, um, they're, 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 they're focused on, the 5,000 laptops are focused on um, uh, uh, schools for girls, and um, the Af Afghani EXO includes uh, health uh, and family health as well as economic development information, for example, the, for the parents. What's very important to understand is that every laptop is, um, is loaded by the, um, you know, by the countries themselves. So the information on there is actually relevant uh, for each of these countries. The other thing we did is to make um, the keyboards easily to change and transform to different languages. So the keyboard of the laptop is a single piece of rubber that can be printed at once. And um, we, have, we have made, actually, keyboards in languages that had never been, uh, where, where there had never been a computer actually created in, in local languages, for example, in Ethiopia and other places. <clears throat> and finally, in Peru, there is about one million of the laptops um, um, in, uh, in, um, in the country. Um, this is one of the few things that the politicians in Peru um, agree, uh, agree about. There's been a change in government um, from a right-leaning to a left-leaning government, and the one thing that those politicians could agree about is that the $100 laptop program had to continue and, in fact, uh, get built up. And this is a little uh, movie um, that was shot in Peru. I was surprised to see it um, when I went to see the Day in the Life. Day in the Life is a, um, a selection, a group of different um, videos taken all around the world and assembled into the picture of a day in the life. And um, in Peru, the, 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 um, the segment about Peru um, is what are you going to see here? Dime, ¿tú a quién quieres mucho? Papá. But design is universal. It doesn't just work in Peru um, or in the developing world. This is my nephew Anthony in uh, Switzerland. 
after he spent a, a, an afternoon trying a prototype of the laptop, but I had to take it back because it was only a prototype. And a couple of weeks later, I got this. <clears throat> this is how he begged me to send him one, which he eventually got, which he eventually got at Christmas. Now we're getting ready to launch the tablet version of the laptop, something we've been working on for a few years. And everything that we've thought, everything that we've put into the original, robustness, lightness, low energy use, is something that we can even do better with, uh, with a tablet. Um, it is portable, of course, um, and we're also working on uh, software um, on the program, which, which is a very um, exciting part of it. Um, this is just an example of, 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 the, of the sort of directory that we're using where kids can ask, I want to be an astronaut, and then they can learn about everything in, in the space. I mean, uh, everything about space and, and being an astronaut. So what makes design different? I believe is the fact that design is generous. Every designer, every maker starts with the idea of giving the world something new, something useful, something beautiful. Making and designing has been really extended from atoms, the, the, the making of products and things, to bits, the making of experiences, software, applications. And today being a maker means that we need to do both, often at the same time and concurrently. This is a sea change in, our, um, in, in my profession. The atoms need, need to be you know, more relevant in our 21st century, sustainable, durable, affordable, customizable. And the bits need to deliver experiences, function, as well as uh, customization for, for our individual needs. So both atoms and bits are the building blocks and very much, at, I believe, at the core of the new businesses and brands that are being, being created right now. They're not the afterthought they once used to be. Um, you know, they are the whole story in my mind. And yes, design makes money. This is something that apparently nobody knew 10 or 12 years ago. Every, every CEO, every company I would start to work with would really challenge me on that, the ROI, the return on investment of design. Steve Jobs and Apple have decidedly given designers credibility in the world of business. What do we do with this? You know, um, you know, how do we use this credibility? How do we manage this responsibility is a very good question for me. But making money is not where every designer, every maker I know starts. In fact, they begin at the intersection of two seemingly opposite instincts. One is making something people want and searching for something that has never been done before. Designers want to please on the one hand, and they want to disrupt on the other. Disrupt the status quo. And in doing so, they become contrarians and hopefully successful ones. These are maybe some of the arguments that Jack and I used to have. <laughs> this is a program called See Better to Learn Better. It's about the free distribution of eyeglasses to kids in Mexico. About 250,000 of these get given away for free to kids in classrooms in Mexico. There's a huge problem in, in rural and poor areas in Mexico, which is essentially kids are not learning because they can't see. Once they're providing, provided with eyeglasses, um, usually that are quite expensive, um, sort of government issued, um, um, not very attractive ones, there is a stigma. There is a stigma against wearing eyeglasses. It's seen as a handicap. Kids don't like it. I think it's pretty much universal. So what we did, um, we partnered with a, with a very high-tech factory in Mexico. And the big idea was to create a, a, a modular system, a design concept that would allow choices that would allow the kids to essentially participate in the making of their eyeglasses. And so we integrated the, manufactured, the manufacturing of the lenses 
custom lenses made um, for the kids' eyesight, and the manufacturing of the frames. This is the first factory in the world that integrated um, both elements at the same time. And you can see a system was put in place, a logistic system was put in place to sort all these materials and colors. And to create a, a large array of choices, um, not made for seasonal reasons or for fashion reasons, but really made for the kids themselves. There's a catalog, so when the kids get their eyesight uh, checked, um, they, there's a catalog, and they can pick between the, 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 they can pick colors, they can pick the colors of the top area and the lower area of the glasses. And that makes a huge difference. Uh, it makes for some pretty interesting eyeglasses. <laughs> <clears throat> but at the distribution, um, it's really a huge surprise. There's a huge amount of enthusiasm. The kids run around, and instead of being ashamed of having to wear eyeglasses, they say, I am unique. I have something different. I'm standing out. And of course, we also worked on making them survive childhood. <laughs> um, there's a, uh, we use a very interesting material called Grillamed, um, which you actually, you can take the glasses and sort of almost bend them backwards um, and they won't break. Design is also adventurous. It's really, for me, about discovery. Um, so there's, there, there's some words that I love that Solbath said. Um, called Why Man Creates, and this is some, Sol Bass is um, one of the most recognized and celebrated graphic designers, and he said in 1968, where do ideas come from? From looking at one thing and seeing another, from fooling around and playing with possibilities, speculating, changing, pushing, pulling, transforming, and if you're lucky, you come up with something maybe worth saving, worth using, and building on. That's when the game stops and the work begins. Here's a project that really illustrates that quite well. And a lot of the good projects that I'm going to explain later start with important questions. Here, we worked with Herman Miller. This is a, this is a page from my, from my sketchbook on uh, the very early days of the project to build a new type of task chair, one that would be lighter, that would be very ergonomic, that would be less expensive, uh, that would be actually affordable, um, and designed with the environment in mind. But we had to really think about a new type of structure uh, in order to deliver what Charles Eames um, said famously, the best to the most for the least. The best materials, the best ergonomics, to the most people for the least amount. I think there's sound that comes with this. So it starts with drawings, many drawings. Hundreds of drawings. We're just showing a few here. And then larger full size ones. Highly detailed expressions of both the structural part of the project as well as the aesthetic. Looking at details, more details, more parts, making mock ups, models in paper and foam plastic by hand with uh, machines <clears throat> and more mock-ups. Some full-sized ones, some scaled ones. This process of experimentation can take years. I showed it here only in about 35 seconds. <laughs> <clears throat> Testing you know, structural theories in uh, three dimensions. We made about 70 prototypes of this chair. Um, these are just eight of them. And you can see how ugly these are. Um, how, but at the same time, how they're starting to express some of these earlier sketches. But every single one of them was 
a discovery. Every single one of these prototypes was actually an extraordinary moment for us, for the team um, um, at Fuse Project, but also for the team at Herman Miller. And a lot of it fails. And there's moments of merging structure and expression, uh, moments of, of beauty and delight, as well as turning these moments into materials research when drawings become three-dimensional, testing the limits of those materials, both in a laboratory setting, but also in the factory, to finally arrive at a theory and an approach for the entire project. And this is eco-dematerialization is one of the ways with which we feel we're able to make um, a big difference on this project, but on many other ones as well. Eco-dematerialization is about taking every single part and reducing it in size, in scale, taking elements away until it is a lot less than what was there before. This is, for example, simply the, the tensioning um, part of the chair. Um, the tensioning knob. But by doing this to every single part, we essentially did something very, very different. Products that are typically low cost, products that are typically affordable, are really not built this way. They're built to be cheap, cheaply made, cheaply produced, with cheap materials. They're not made to last. They're not made to last 12 years, as, um, as, as, for example, this product is warranted to 12 years. It's made to last a lot longer than that. But this is, this, is, this is the kind of responsibility that both manufacturers and designers have, which is, let's make things affordable. Let's use less materials. Um, but let's, let's make them better, which means a bigger investment up front, rather than just having uh, um, uh, things made um, literally cheaply. And eco-dematerialization also means that every ounce that is removed out of this process um, of making the product lighter, um, every part, um, whether it's a detail or whether it's a structural part um, that is carved out, um, that means simply less materials means less cost. And less materials also means less carbon footprints, uh, less carbon footprint. So, it's, 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 a, it's a pretty simple theory, but think of it applied to everything around us. Um, um, you know, it makes, it makes a big difference. Usually at this point, there's another question that pops up. Often students ask this question, which is, why do we need another chair? Aren't there enough chairs out there? <clears throat> Does the world need another chair? My answer is, why do we need to write another book? Why? It's relevance. It's the chair that is designed today is more efficient. It's made better. It will last longer. It will use less materials. We need to make another million chairs because another million chairs means another million jobs that we're going to put people into, for example, uh, in, a, in a world that is soon going to be 7 billion and a world that is soon going to be maybe 9 billion. We need products that, are, that look into the future, that are made more efficiently. We need to go through these discoveries to get to materials that are more sustainable, to um, using reclaimed uh, materials to make our products, um, that is actually a very critical uh, part of what design is about. And so, designing for the future is, for me, designing for sustainability. <clears throat> every industry, every manufacturing site, every logistics system, every service really needs to be rethought in the next 10 to 15 years. It needs to be rethought um, to be more sustainable, to use less energy, to be more efficient. And that means that design has to be a big part of it. It's not about doing less. It's actually about delivering more. 
But how do we do this? You know, how do we get to this? And what I have found is that starting with questions is much better, works a lot better than starting with answers. It's about having, it's about having the right goal in mind, but no specific target. This is a project that was started um, with Puma a few years ago, and it was about redesigning their shoebox. There was nothing wrong with their shoebox. This is exploring the logistics and the complexity of shipping and robots picking up goods and, and, and working through a distribution system. There's nothing wrong with their shoebox back then. It was perfect. It was beautiful. Their brand was plastered on it. It was red. Um, it delivered and protected 80 million shoes shipping from point A to point B uh, across the world. But they had an instinct that maybe the shoebox could be rethought, could be reinvented, could be addressed in a new way. Um, and, and the shoebox became this, the clever little bag. If you go to a Puma store today, if you go to um, 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 a, a lot of uh, shoe stores in general that carry Puma, you will get um, this instead of a hard cardboard box. <clears throat> this works across the entire system, the entire distribution chain. Um, imagine convincing German logistics engineers to change something that had absolutely no problem, with, you know, no, that, 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 were, that had no issues whatsoever. And we could only do that if this new approach, if the clever little bag, did everything, in or, or the, the standard shoebox did already well, uh, but it did it better. And this is about delivering more, as I said, rather than de delivering less. It's made of two very simple parts, a recycled uh, PET material, um, which is a fabric material, and a very, very thin, non-structural, uh, non-printed uh, piece of cardboard. When separately, these two elements are not structural, but put together with one, with, with the, um, the soft part wrapped around the cardboard, as in here, uh, it does become structural and survive um, the, uh, the trip, as well as protect, uh, protect the shoes. And once you're at the store, um, you can actually even choose to uh, take your shoes home in that uh, clever little bag, um, rather than the big vinyl plastic shopping bags that are offered there. This process reduces material use for 80 million pairs of shoes again by 60% and reduces the energy use by 65%. Um, and this, you know, again, multiplied at the scale, 80 million shoes shipped from point A to point B, makes uh, quite a large difference. The other thing that's important in this is not just to deliver sustainability or sustainability solutions to the consumer, um, <clears throat> but to make them participate. Uh, and in this case, um, we have this really sort of fun engagement. We have all these pictures of how people are reusing this bag. Um, of course, the bag can be recycled when it's not in use anymore, but a much better um, uh, approach is to reuse it for um, all, kinds of, um, all kinds of needs. <clears throat> Another part of the project, um, we had to look at, and unfortunately you can't see what this is completely, there's a t-shirt in here, a full-size t-shirt that's in a plastic bag. The contrast on the screen isn't, um, isn't as strong. Um, and we had, um, you know, the, the, the issue is that every piece of garment um, that is manufactured in Asia has to be shipped in a plastic bag, especially if it comes out of uh, China. There's laws and, um, and other reasons for that. And we struggled with this one because we couldn't change the laws. We couldn't change the logistics and the demands of the, of the, um, uh, of the, of the businesses. And one day, I think three or four weeks into the project, into researching materials, into researching the, the laws, one of our designers came up with the idea of, let's fold the t-shirt one more time. <laughs> so, the name for this is, I'm half the bag I used to be. The clever half bag. 
Um, but we were also able to replace the material to a PLA, a biodegradable uh, type of plastic. So what, you know, what, what, what good design does best for me is that it accelerates the adoption of new ideas, important 21st century new ideas. And I will briefly talk about a few projects and ideas um, for which design is an accelerant. For example, the idea that sustainable vehicles using electric motors can, develop, can, can deliver the thrill and the excitement of a gas guzzler. Until we as designers can show great products that are exciting, that are beautiful, um, that work well, that, that give a sense of quality, people say, and that are also affordable, people will not adopt um, these new technologies. And so we raced this motorcycle. And even um, for the thrill, beat a world speed record about four years ago. Or oh, here's another idea that design can accelerate. The notion that, the, the, you know, change the stigma around condom use and actually change health statistics of AIDS infection and teen pregnancies in New York. This is a New York City condom. Mayor Blomberg um, and the Department of Health of New York decided one day that they wanted the, the, the free distribution of condoms to be more um, effective and design was a solution for that. So we designed the dispensers and the wrappers, and you, could, you can find these everywhere in New York, from a, a, a bodega, um, a Puerto Rican bodega on 105th Street, to bars and clubs, of course. What it does there, what design does here, is start a conversation. Start a conversation that um, sometimes is hard to have. Another accelerant, another idea that's important to, to, um, to, 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 to promote is that electric power can be dispensed everywhere uh, in a practical and an integrated way for our cities. This is a wet station for General Electric, a way to bring electric power on the streets um, for electric cars. This is something I said at the presentation of this, is that I don't believe anybody, I don't believe anyone will miss the trip to the gas station. And I don't believe anyone will miss the visual disruption and environmental disruption that gas stations have on our cities, on the way our cities look and feel and smell. Um, this is, for example, the, um, the uh, residential unit. Um, you can buy this at Lowe's. Um, um, and at other hardware stores today. Another, another idea, another project um, that, that, that we love to do, uh, we've done a few lighting projects, including with Herman Miller, but this is one that we've done with Swarovski. To dispel the idea that chandeliers, that crystal, was, you know, was this um, sort of fancy and, 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 and uh, wasteful, uh, type of uh, type of display. So what it is is a beautiful light with all of the burst and the you know what 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 you want out of crystal. What you know how how crystal is beautiful, but it only uses a single LED, a high efficient um, light, a single crystal, and paper. And by designing the geometry as well as the focus of the light in the right way, we can get to these types of effects. There is poetry in this, um, in, in this simplicity. And of course, you know, throughout, design is also about beauty. But if it is not ethical, it can't be beautiful. So <clears throat> I'll conclude here, and then I think we'll have a little time for questions. Um, so whether we're reducing materials and energy consumption by a large percent percentage for shoeboxes, for example, or creating the logistics that allow for hundreds of thousands of eyeglasses to be distributed to children in Mexico, or whether we're changing the perception that sustainability products 
and their energy use is something that is more expensive or less attractive than their counterparts. What good design does best is accelerate the adoption of new ideas. And what the world wants, really, are for, to experience these new ideas, to experience them uh, for themselves. Arguably, it is my opinion that American design today is better understood than our foreign policy. <laughs> people, people crave and admire what YouTube or the One Laptop Per Child or the iPhone can do for them, from Palestine to Brazil and, and all around. And if our entrepreneurs and our designers continue to apply design as an accelerant, I believe that designers will cement a reputation as the best ambassadors of our culture. A culture driven by the right intent. A culture that is generous. A culture that is adventurous and sustainable. That is why, I think as one of the titles of this speech says, that is why I believe that our role as designers is not just to design the future, but to bring us the future. Thank you very much. Okay, we have time for a short Q&A, and I know that there are probably a lot of attendees with questions. If you don't get to ask your question today, please know that you can go to chicagohumanities.org and follow us on Twitter, where you can get the hashtag to ask Eve a question. And the best question will win the chair that is on stage signed by Eve, and he's going to sign it for us right now. Who would like to ask Eve a question on this side? I see a hand. Hello. Um, hi. Hi. My question is, um, you have a very multicultural background from a Turkish father, and you lived in Switzerland, and then I guess you moved to different geographies for different time periods. You've done your research. No, no, this is... Um, what else have you found This out? will lead to the question. <laughs> My question is, um, how does this influence your visual language and in terms of design forms um, that has to meet certain function requirements, what's the translation of these? I think, I, I think that's a very good question um, because I, I don't really believe that design should be stylistically driven, that design is about a form or a visual signature that then gets applied across products um, that have completely different functions and different aims. I do believe that design is very much influenced by the context in which it has to go, is very much influenced by the materials and technologies, and that it really has to go beyond just being about aesthetics. Aesthetics is important. That's how people receive something. That's how they want something. That's how they experience it. But what drives the aesthetic isn't style. Um, it's ideas and some of the ideas that I um, talked about today. I have a question regarding the eyeglass uh, project in Mexico. Sure. If the frames and lenses are built as a unified piece, are the lenses able to be changed as the child grows? So they're built at the same time, not as a unified piece. So the two lenses in the picture I showed before um, are, are shaped um, in, in a traditional fashion. They're plastic lenses, but they're shaped uh, separately, um, and then they're assembled um, inside the frames. So yes, the, the kids actually get tested um, every year or so, I believe, um, and those lenses, lenses can be switched. Um, I, I will add that actually this program has been so successful in Mexico that we've had a lot of interest from uh, American municipalities to, uh, to bring it. And we actually just, um, I'm, I forgot to put that picture in the presentation, but we um, uh, just launched it in the Bay Area, in San Francisco and Oakland. Um, we have a crazy looking bus. It's bright blue with hundreds of eyes on it, which we needed to make the bus also exciting for the kids because they're afraid of going into these things. Um, 
and, um, and that's driving around and, um, and um, giving eye exams and then um, about a week to two weeks later delivering eyeglasses for the children. Is there anyone else on this side? I see a hand. I was very interested in the one laptop per child uh, program. Mm -hmm. And as a former teacher, I was wondering why those, are those available for parents to buy here and perhaps a portion of the profits might be donated to buying more laptops for children worldwide? Um, this, is, this is an idea, a, a gener very generous idea that we've heard from a lot of, um, from a lot of um, from a lot of people who've uh, come and become acquainted with the project. Um, and this is something that we've been wanting to do for quite a while. The issue is that um, the program has, has certain principles, which um, we will, I, I, I can explain further, but one of the principles is that we want every child in a classroom to have one. So there's been a lot of um, interest in, in the United States to sort of buy a few at a time and kind of give one at a time to different children. Um, but we felt the maximum effect and the maximum success um, of the program comes out of um, this being a, you know, a, 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 a technology that every child in a classroom is using at the same time and that every child is taking home um, as well. That said, we are a couple of months away from announcing uh, some very interesting projects that will also allow um, more, more development in the U.S. of the One Laptop Per Child. So uh, stay tuned. We have a question on the other side. I'm wondering with the One Laptop Per Child, you said that the government chooses what gets to go on it. Sure. And so I'm wondering if you find that certain places don't allow certain things to be on the programs or whatever? <clears throat> well, the, the, um, it comes, the, the, um, the laptop comes with about 100 different programs in math and physics and geography, um, and science, biology, etc. So it, and it comes with books as well. The, the, the laptops each come um, with, for example, with 100 books, uh, which means that, and those we can load different books on there. But, we also have to recognize that it's simply in different cultures, um, you know, the, the, you know the, the requirements or the expectations or the cultural aspect will, you know, dictate some of the content. So, you know, this is not, this is, this is really not a, a, a program that tries to sort of give a one-size-fits-all type of education, but rather really relies on individual countries to, um, to cater to their population, um, not just in content, but obviously also in language. Um, um, and as I said before, you know, we have a lot of very local cultures that never had um, this kind of technology or this kind of um, uh, keyboard or ability to, um, 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 to, um, uh, to renew and, 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 and uh, integrate their culture in this new digital age. So, you know, it's a, it's a, there's, there's many different ways in which um, you can sort of see this kind of issue. We have a question in the front. Hi. Um, what kind of advice can you give to young designers that just finished school? <laughs> <laughs> there's an email. Oh. Um, <clears throat> I think, well, I don't know if that's advice, but uh, advice. But I do think we're we're going to enter a golden age of design, and I do think that design is more relevant today than it ever was before. Um, whether it's uh, in government, whether it's in private, uh, in corporate, and in, 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 in a corporate environment, whether it um, whether it's more like the way we practice design, which is in consultancies, um, whether you're looking at service, government service, health service. Um, whether you're looking at areas like pharma, pharmaceuticals, and others, health, um, all those areas are really in need of designers. So I would look wide. I would look at what you're passionate about, um, and I would apply sort of your own kind of 
knowledge. I would, be, I would go out there and be a pioneer because there's so many different areas that don't have design that need it. Um, uh, whether it's for commercial or nonprofit, I mean, it really doesn't matter. Design is in demand pretty much across the board. Um, um, and so you can, you can really sort of start um, in new places. For example, in the healthcare business, there is a, a, a deep need for, um, for, for design, whether it's, um, and, and that's, that's, I believe, an under, um, developed, you know, area of the field, for example. Um, so I would look wide, but I also look in as far as what your passion is, what kind of problems you want to solve, um, how you want to contribute to the world, and um, go with that. Um, I'm wondering if you've identified any particular design process, steps along the way toward good design, that you and maybe your your uh, your team sure. follow, or does do you leave a lot to random brainstorming and whatever interesting images and thoughts occur to you? I mean, how does that kind of flow that design sure. process? Um, you know, the design process is is not a it's not a, a it's not a formula. I believe um, there's there's ways. I mean, there's certainly steps that we take. Um, we want to be centered around ideas, so we spend a lot of time early in a project talking about ideas, talking about where the world is going, talking about what's, um, what's possible to achieve, um, and how you know, new ideas that are both social ideas or technological ideas or societal ideas can really, can really create a, a, a new direction. Um, that's how we spend a lot of our early times in the, in the, during the design process. But, you know, design can include research. It can include um, sort of uh, you know a lot of experimentation, as I was showing. Um, and it it really always, to me, it always has to follow an idea, but it can use many different types of resources in order to solve problems. Um, and it's such a diverse field that it's hard to say you will need this kind of to push these five buttons, and you know you'll you'll get there. I think it actually makes design much more interesting because, you know, for example, if I use sustainability, there isn't one solution fits all that's going to work for every industry. That's going to work across the, 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 the you know, diverse you know, enterprises that we work with. Um, it really is about uh, quite often a, um, a, set of, a set of principles and ideas and approaches, but then that needs to be applied very specifically to um, and and uh, in a way invented um, in you know for different uh, type of industries. So there is certainly a process. Maybe it looked a little chaotic, um, <clears throat> but chaos is also something that I think most designers um, can embrace. We do have time for another question. Is there anyone in the middle section that didn't get to ask? I guess I'm curious about projects that you might not want to take on, some that you've turned down. I know you designed some very lively looking sex toys, so that industry I was obviously that. appealing. I, I did want to take that project on. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what are projects that, that have not interested you that you felt really weren't a good fit? Um, there's, uh, there's a few, but what's been interesting is that we haven't had to do a lot of selection. There's almost a self-selecting process that happens. People know about our work. They know that we like to, to break ground. They know that we, we're not incremental in our approach, that we like to take big steps and sometimes bigger risks. Um, and so we haven't had a lot of projects uh, like this, which is, you know, just design the next version of something that you know, in our opinion, isn't, isn't right. Um, uh, I, I don't know if you know, but, uh, you know, if you know, but one billion of these is produced every day. Um, one billion of these. And three quarters of them end up in the landfill or, or the oceans. Only, only a quarter of them is, uh, is uh, recycled. So, for example, this is, this is something that 
you know, we, you know, and there's ways to innovate this. So if it was somebody who came to us to innovate on this particular um, problem, um, we would love to work on it. But if it's just to iterate on it, um, um, this is probably something that we would, um, um, that we, we, we would pass. Okay, I'd like to remind everybody that if you didn't get to ask your question today, today through November 16th, you can go online at chicagohumanities.org slash askeve and get the hashtag when you follow us on Twitter and ask Eve a question and you might win the signed chair. Thank you.